What's up, guys? Welcome to another edition of Before the Whistle presented by BRK Insurance Group. If your business is looking for the best in employee benefits, commercial property, and casualty insurance, or retirement and 401k plan services, there's no one better suited to meet your challenges and build a plan centered around your needs than BRK Insurance Group. What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to Before the Whistle here in this exact format. And I'm your host, Maddie Hudak. And this is going to be the last time that I'm going to be uh, releasing an episode here on Hard in the Pate Sports Channel uh, here with Dave Grubb. I, I'm an awkward person, so I mean, I'll just announce it. Uh, Sports Illustrated has acquired this before the Whistle podcast. And so this is my final show within this channel. The show itself is obviously going to continue. I have to kind of figure out how to get the production elements down and everything like that. It's really exciting for me. Uh, just this is an industry where you never really know when your breaks are going to come. And all of mine have come at the most unexpected times. This show being one of them, the sideline job, the Sports Illustrated writing job. And now this podcast, you know, I intended to have a guest on this show this week, all to show how quickly really things happen. Um, and so that's going to be something that we'll be moving forward with. I, I hopefully starting next week. My goal is to, you know, really kind of get those things down. But it wouldn't have felt right me, for me to hear, um, to not really kind of give a proper adieu to just this space as an organic source of growth where I wouldn't have this opportunity without Dave, without this channel, and without all of you who have listened and subscribed and have given me a chance to get better at this and have something that, you know, I I'm able to turn into something I can make a living with. Um, that all comes from all of the people that have been here from day one, where it it's so hard to succeed in this industry, uh, especially when you're, you're kind of going at it with just yourselves, but it's all about the people. And that's always been what this show has been about, what my coverage of football and, and frankly, you know, life have been, but it's all about the right people because, you know, I, I wasn't ready for a podcast that had that kind of reach a, a few years ago. I'm going to go through my journey on here, but this wouldn't be possible without all of these steps that I've taken really to get to this point. And just the, I guess, luck of what I've been able to witness over the last couple of years at Tulane. Uh, I didn't have the space for the two and 10 year or the cotton ball year, but to have it last year, to be able to cover the turnover, the change to John Summerall, that to me, it's allowed me to grow what I'm able to do so much more. And really what it comes down to at the end of the day is reps. I, my earlier episodes, it's night and day from my ability to speak and organize my thoughts retain eye contact. I'm going to have my, you know, entire ado here really, cause that's what I'm going to do on this episode. Uh, I'll get give a little bit of two lane analysis and kind of put that all into one, but it really just was something that I wanted to do one last time was just take a look back through, you know, it started with my first episode was called my journey. And that was really more a journey of my life. But as I'm bringing this on with sports illustrated, still going to be before the whistle again, that's just going to be Moving forward in that medium, I just really wanted to look back on my journey here, all of the guests I've had on here that have made such a difference, all of the eras and, you know, the golden era of Tulane football that we're all a part of right now. And you know, the re reason that I'm able to be able to have these various career opportunities, it, it, a lot of that has to do with the success of a team and it is what it is, but just the way that everyone has really bought into this new era and it's kept rolling and it's as high as it is to be talking about, again, this is the first year where Tulane's ever clinched the spot in the conference game before the season's wrapped up. And we're on the bye week waiting to play Memphis and really show everyone how dominating this Tulane team is. And that's all that I've seen throughout this week. And I'm going to give that kind of brief update here today. But as I said, this has always been about the people to me. It's always been how I've approached the sport. And to me, the people on this Friday of this bye week, as I enter this really exciting new venture for myself, are, are the ones that I want to highlight, starting with you all that are listening to this now. Oh, I'm going to get to the Tulane stuff, but people that are listening to this show and you know why I really want to do this segment, I have a feeling if you've been following along this show from the get-go that 
you know that I've been talking about, you know, more than just sports. That's really kind of the idea behind the name before the whistle was I really wanted to look at the human element and just how much goes into before you take the snap on the field, particularly with my access as Tulane sideline reporter and the journey that I've been able to follow both, you know, along on the sideline and by having this space created by you guys. Um, and, and I've always talked about things that are more than sports on here. And this podcast to me is more than sports. Uh, and I really wouldn't be having this conversation about any of this right now if it weren't for the people that started watching this show back in you know May of 2023 and have really followed along and allowed me to have an opportunity to take this you know podcast on to the next level. You, know, you look at podcasts and it's such a saturated market and it's really hard to come in, have a unique idea, differentiate yourself and really, you know, build a model of success. Um, and you really can only do that either, you know, with a larger network. But if you start off in, in the way that I did, you have to really build a loyal base of people that are going to be tuning into your show. And I really felt it, it's just been such a wild feeling. You know, I'll go, I'll talk to the Greenbackers and know that they follow along with my podcast. I'll hear from, you know, people that work at Tulane. And I, it always kind of surprises me because I, you know, I have imposter syndrome a little bit. Um, that, but really what got to me the most was the student section at one of the games this year, some of the guys that were the overalls yelled my name over and said that they love my before the whistle podcast. And that to me really uh, meant a lot because I feel like I'm on the, you know, in the middle, I guess, of, you know, what I would consider the lost generation of Tulane football fans, myself graduating in 2016, I'm 30 years old now. Yay. Um, and it was really cool to see, you know, the amount of people from my graduating class and in my, you know, kind of while I was at the school, all up in Annapolis for the military bowl. But to hear that there are people, you know, there are guys at the school that are following along with this, it just says so much about, you know, how far Tulane's come, but it's allowed me to be able to really have this conversation and have a space here to grow. Um, and very early on, you know, when I started this podcast, I started it in May and I primarily cover football. I, I've really, you know, I, I've done a lot of kind of segues. I did an episode on the baseball team um, and talking about you know, the psychology of sports and what have you. But uh, eventually, once the season started, it just, you know, it made sense to focus my podcast on Tulane. And there wasn't a, another Tulane podcast that exists out there. I know I, I'm someone that's a writer. Um, I personally don't really listen to podcasts. If I do, it's with a video component. I just auditory learning and, and paying attention is hard for me. And I've always really been a reader. And I also know, I know a lot of people that really support me and are probably not going to read all of my articles because they're just not readers um, and exclusively listen to podcasts. So yeah, there's a ton of college football ones out there, but there wasn't one that really existed for Tulane. And so, you know, just kind of with respect to covering the football perspective of things and looking at, you know, the ins and outs of what it takes to build um, a team. And so kind of having that ability to have a space to do that level of analysis, especially when, you know, I, I've taken so much away from my job on the sideline. I don't think I could be having these ideas to analyze, let alone provide this analysis without that view. But this gives me a space to kind of give a lot of the thoughts that you know, I'm just not able to in a game setting. And oftentimes ones that I marinate on, I always come home and games are over, rewatch them. And then it's just become such an enjoyable part of my routine sitting down here and you know talking to myself, but talking to all of you about th this program. And what I know from the people listening to this is they are really loyal and really strong Tulane fans. And so this has been really special for me to have a home to build and again, be able to get one of these opportunities, but, and I'm going to get to Dave Grubb as my, you know, final thank you here, because I just look back to, you know, I, my first episode of the show and I was kind of trying to figure out how I wanted to go about this final show. I was actually you know, going to have a guest on and then having this all kind of happen in the middle of the week. It just kind of, you know, it felt right to have this begin the way that it ended. And this is not an end. It's just, you know, with this journey, if you will, of, you know, really it was just me and Dave setting out to build a space and have this presence. And, you know, we were that we've accomplished that with all of this. So this is just kind of the end of it on this specific channel. But I look back to my first episode and it's cringy for me to watch back. And, 
you know, I knew that I was inexperienced with podcasting at the time. And I've always said this to people. I'm going on so many tangents here. If you watch that first episode, I just claim that I have ADHD, but you know, I did a podcast way back when, and I've gone on radio and just done all these random things so that when I had the opportunity to have a space for a podcast, I had to kind of figure out how to do it, but I didn't feel like a complete fish out of water when I first started, but you know, I really had to prepare what to say, uh, write things out. So I wouldn't just kind of be going on an, a tangent and, and rambling. And the reason I did that first episode, the way that I did about kind of going through my you know life journey was I know that I'm not perhaps an, a, uh, you know, a typical podcaster in the sense that I do go on tangents, the way that my brain works. It is like, you know, I'm not going to call myself a mad scientist because that's giving myself too much credit, but it's, you know, the rabbit holes come to me. I don't go to the rabbit holes a lot of the time. Uh, you know, I always am on these research tangents. It's just my brain will think of something and I have ADHD. That's what I just claimed in that one. And so, yeah, I sometimes go on a tangent from here to there, but doing this show has given me so much respect for people that you know, do this and have been doing this and have really built a space here because, you know, it's easier said than done to stare at a camera and not really be able to, you know, I have notes in front of me, but you have to really kind of be able to carry a conversation with yourself. Uh, and that's certainly something that's easier said than done. And then the other thing for me too, was being able to learn how to really interview such different types of people. And I just want to go through, you know, a lot of the guests that really stuck out to me. And, you know, again, I know that this is I just said that this is all a Tulane football podcast, but I wouldn't be here without all these enriching conversations I had. The first one I had was a psychology conversation about the AIQ, which is something they use to assess cognitive abilities in the draft with Dr. Mike Clark. My next guest was, you know, Tulane legend, Sean King. I mean, that, that was pretty incredible. We had never really spoken, um, you know, in that type of setting. And it was such a natural flow and really gave me such a great sense of the other era of greatness that I really, I, you know, I was, four years old when that team happened. Then I had, again, my mentor, Todd Graffinini on this show. Um, I, I went into a scouting episode with uh, my friend Deuce Windham. Ross Jackson came on here. And I will say I took so much from that conversation on how to be a better podcaster. And, you know, my eye contact and a lot of the things that I do today come from that episode and, you know, conversations I have with Ross all the time. But just to I, I go to the fact of, how much this podcast has just gone past the football field. Mike Dettelier, he is, you know, one of my favorite guests. He is just a, a wealth of information. And all of these people that I'm going through, a lot of them got very weird starts into sports. Mike was an aquatic engineer. Ross worked, you know, in the theater. Uh, Deuce Windham, he went to the scouting academy like myself. Um, uh, but just to kind of have that journey of people that, you know, we all kind of did it our way. And it's been cool to watch that unfold and have people on the show. I had Dave Grubb himself on here. I had Corey Glore on here. Something I also always think back to that conversation, you know, really learning what a play-by-play -play guy does versus a color analyst, how we all have to look at different facets of the game. And to be able to kind of spitball on just that topic alone, I learned so much from that. Having, you know, two back-to-back -back women on that I'm, I'm so close with, Brooke Kirchhofer and Kendall Duncan, and being able to just talk football with another woman. It reminded me a lot of the first radio show I hosted with ESPN New Orleans. I had Kat Terrell come in for the last half of, or the last hour of that. A, three hours is a, a hell of a show to do. And I, I knew I was just going to kind of run out of steam and I would need someone there. But it was so cool for us to just kind of take over the airwaves and be two women discussing football. So that's what I did for those two weeks. And that was, you know, I, that was one of my favorite stretches of the show. Uh, Sam Lockwood, he is a G. He is one of my you know really good friends at this point. We were in the same graduating class. And for us to both kind of, I mean, credit to him, he went to all of the Tulane games when we went there. But for us to really find our way back here and kind of start, again, this generation, our, our age, class of 16, class of around that, getting back into this program, I think, you know, our work, I hit my, my and then going on Fear the Wave podcast with him as well, has really helped out with that. Um, and, and then the players that, ultimately make all this go, you know, Jarius Monroe, AJ Hampton, Lance Robinson, Sincere Hainsworth, Lawrence Keyes, Nick Anderson. I hope I didn't forget any of the players that came on here because I always took so much away from each and every one of those conversations. And when I look back through how much I've been able to really cover on this show and see that my ability to speak, it, it translates both on this podcast when I go and do radio hits, when I've done TV things and on the sideline, I feel like this has really given me 
that space to analyze and get as as good at my job as you know I really want to be at at this point. Um, obviously, I want to keep growing, but that's really been this the show to me has been the difference maker because it's been a space for me where you know this show for me wasn't around when I, I started, where we went two and ten, had the greatest single season turnaround in college football history. I learned so much from that. And, you know, I, I was looking for a space to either write or just speak my thoughts on these great guys, this incredible turnaround in football culture. And, you know, I finally was able to do that here with this show. And then, you know, I get one season of being able to do that. And Willie Fritz leaves in December. And, you know, that was one of the more difficult episodes I had to do because, you know, I, it was hard for me to be, you know, removed enough as a podcaster but how much Willie did for my career, how much I know the emotions were still running so high. That was a Monday after the championship game. You know, it was that Saturday. He was gone by Sunday. Um, and, you know, it was a little bleak. But I think we all got through it. And then my next episode was when they hired John Sumrall. And, I, I mean, I could not have asked for, you know, at least from a selfish perspective on here, a more candid head coach that gives – media, such great access, such great insight. He respects every single question that we ask him, all of the players, uh, you know, for being an introvert that took a few years to really feel super confident in a, a lot of what I was doing. I had to really kind of expedite that both with this entire coaching staff turnover, but with all of the roster turnover as well. Um, and so I just couldn't have asked for a better transition and I couldn't have asked for a better time in Tulane football to have had this podcast start during other than the greatest single season turnaround. But I've always kind of liked, you know, sports. I, I've said this life imitates sports, sports uh, and, and life as you know, unless you're one of the sec teams that, you know, should, should be in the playoffs every year, or you were the Patriots for so ever long, you know, there's heartbreak, there's failure, there's tough S H I T that you deal with on the field, off the field, off the field stuff that comes onto the field. But in terms of it imitating life, all that to say, I feel like those conversations as hard as they are to have, I, I almost enjoy the opportunity to be able to do that because I, you know, I look back on that space and you know what my analysis was at the time to have, you know, a, an instant first impression video of, you know, my thoughts on John Summerall as a head coach after the press conference that aged as well as you could have asked for back in December, and then to be able to really have almost a diary of the journey that this team has taken this year. Uh, it, it's allowed me to, uh, you know, I think help give some publicity and get people following along with the Tulane program. It's helped me become a better sideline reporter, a better podcaster, uh, better at all of my jobs in tandem. It allowed me to feel prepared for when I had this, you know, the writing job with Sports Illustrated come on that I had kind of been used to interviewing people from doing this medium because now I have to wear those kind of different hats where I'm asking questions in press conferences, sitting people down for interviews. But I had to kind of get used to doing that because of this program. And so all of that to say, that's another thing that I always give people advice. when I've, I've talked to a lot of classes recently and that every experience that you can think of that might not matter. You know, I, I got on sports talk radio because of Marshawn Lattimore getting arrested and me having a master's in legal studies and I took an independent course in criminal procedure, I all of a sudden was a, a legal expert on the gun laws in Ohio. That got me onto the show. Uh, again, the podcast that I did, all those things that you just don't think that much about. But if I hadn't been doing this and been so tapped into the program once the season was over, because when I was just doing the sideline stuff, I would do radio, I'd go and try to do that. But I didn't have a medium to really be able to kind of continue my coverage of that throughout an off season and allow myself to have a space for stuff like draft coverage, for example. So this has just been a great ride. And I feel like, it, it, I, again, if you want to go back, listen to my earlier episodes, if you're someone that's looking at for a living state of improvement, I am rambling a lot right now because this has just kind of come, it happened really fast. It was a surprise. And I wanted to do one more episode of this before you know I get things rolling with that one, but kind of trying to figure out, yeah, I, I know that this is a Tulane podcast. I'm going to get to some Tulane analysis here. Um, but ultimately, I, I just had to kind of take a minute here to thank the people and thank all of you for, as I said, allowing me to 
have an audience to keep this viable and to put myself, you know, in a position to succeed in a very difficult industry. And all you need a lot of the time is just one chance. And it's hard to get that chance. And you know, if you screw it up, you might not get one for a really long time. But this podcast, what, what Dave Grubb did for me was give me a chance. It gave me a, an ability to focus my coverage on Tulane because you know, I was writing about the Saints and I still watch them and do radio about them. But it is so hard during the season to go to the press box at you know, call time of 10 a.m. or whatever the next morning after I'm getting home from a, a plane ride at 2 a.m. I've sweat out 13 pounds depending on the time of year. And I, I just you know, exhausted and put everything into all of my Tulane coverage that ultimately it, it was just better for me to be able to focus all of my time on that and have a space to give all of the insight that I see on the sidelines. I see during practice. I, I see just through my conversations, interactions with people, uh, my, my analysis of football that I would like to say is pretty freaking good for what it's worth of, you know, what I've seen from the two and 10 year to under John Summerall and feeling like I'm confident in my ability to do that type of analysis. That all comes from Dave Grubb giving me a chance here on this show, giving me feedback when I started this and I was super evergreen and yeah, I, I did a lot of radio stuff. I've done TV hits, TV hits. They're, you know, short and sweet. Radio, I can be looking wherever I, I can be doing 12 things at once. Um, but here, having the connection of just remembering to look at the camera, learning how to time my seg segments out. So I didn't start rambling as I kind of did in earlier episodes. There was somewhere, you know, I'd lose my train of thought and freak out and start the whole episode over. It was so inefficient. And so to have someone like Dave be able to not just give me an opportunity to have this platform, but to give me that critical feedback, that's the reason that I am having this roundup episode that I'm having right now. But, uh, you know, it, it's that, it's you guys, and it's the Tulane football program. It's all of the access that I've gotten, the players that have come on and been, you know, so welcoming and great interviews. I, I mean, it's been such a just pleasure to have a space to get to be able to highlight that and to have it in both now, you know, written and a podcast setting and have that, you know, keep continuing on over at Sports Illustrated to have this home, have it start where it was, start kind of with a really personal, my journey thing. I, I went through what was kind of a traumatic set, a series of jobs in the corporate workplace, uh, working in psychology, working in the law. And it was more that often than not, not the job itself. It was just bad, insidious people that I came across. And when I came into sports, my bottom line was I'm not dealing with that anymore. Uh, and life is too short to be miserable at your job for those reasons. I know that, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be miserable at your job and some are unavoidable, but having a situation that affects your mental health to that big of a degree because of a toxic person, a toxic environment, a toxic culture, my, my advice remains to get out. And so that's also been something that's been super important to me to feel like I have had such comforting, stable between Corey uh, with the sideline, Cade with Sports Illustrated, Dave with the show, to just feel as free as I've been able to feel. And I've covered some topics on here that have been hard. There's been some comments that, you know, whatever, I learned to stop reading those a long time ago. And I wouldn't feel confident enough to do that if I really didn't feel like my boss is all, you know, everyone here called him what, whatever, had my back, um, that I, I could learn on the fly here because there's no other way to do it. Uh, there's no other way to figure out that I suck at eye contact when I'm doing video stuff other than doing some videos of this and figuring that out in the first place, that there are ways for me to write a story and there's a very different way to tell a story on a podcast. And especially if it's some people listen to the video, some people listen to the audio, learning how to engage and keep my thoughts on one train of thought, I say again, ironically, that's all been really because of this medium. But Tulane could have been a bad football program. I, I covered them to, through the two and 10 year. To me, it, it's less about what's going on on the field. And it's more about if you're in a bad environment. And I not only have I been in such a great environment with respect to my various hats that I wear uh, in this wild sports industry, but 
I have had such a wild four year run here at Tulane of the, the most utmost high character guys, coaching staff, players. It, it's uh, people that work within the program. You know, it, I feel like I'm in a bubble of delusion of, I don't really think that a lot of successful programs, everyone is truly like this nice young men, great of people kind of thing, but it makes it so easy to really want to do this show and yes, give post game analysis, but really highlight these guys. And I feel like this year in particular, I've gotten better at a lot of the things that I do with respect to my sideline reporting um, and with my analysis on this show. And you guys can all correct me if I'm wrong in my uh, <laughs> future episodes of the show that I'll continue once I figure out you know, what I'm doing from a production standpoint. But um I'm sorry. That's so funny. This is the most perfect uh, before the whistle episode ever, because after I, I think a pretty decent streak of not actually losing my train of thought, I talked about losing my train of thought and then made myself do it. Um, so yeah, here we are. Uh, <laughs> anything's exactly how we started just with me being a little bit of a chaotic hot mess, but one very passionate about what I do, what I cover and you all that I'm talking to. But I, what I was saying is, you know, I've gotten better for a lot of reasons, but the football that I've been able to cover this season in particular, it's been so special to be able to do between a coaching change, bringing in a new group of guys, a quarterback competition that I, I could really compare and start contrast to the one I'd covered over with the Saints. And there, the, the answer is there was no Darian Mensa in that quarterback competition. But then being able to cover a coaching staff that, you know, had for lack of a better term, the balls to start a red short freshman. Um, that is something in itself that has been so exciting to cover to see how they've gone about his development as a quarterback, where they've actually allowed him to legitimately develop, where you see all these guys get to the NFL and then coaches just punt them out the door, despite you know, some of them being 23 and their brains aren't even fully developed yet, uh, and not even attempting to develop them at all. All that to say, what they have done with Darian Mensa. You could just see that light bulb go off. And it wasn't as if he just had that one touchdown run. You could see that once the switch run off, it wasn't just those long runs. Again, it's those third and fourth down conversions with his legs. But just being able to watch his growth in this season, be able to watch how the whole team responds to a change at leadership where I, I have not been around other quarterbacks in Tulane history besides Michael Pratt and Darian Metza. Um, it, it's a hell of a duo. And it was pretty... Uh, it was hard to fathom how they would immediately follow up everything that Brat, P Pratt brought to the table. Darian really has all of that. And you can see why Michael Pratt went out of his way to mentor him, but this is a player led team that goes across the board. And what these guys have been able to accomplish this year and come together as one. I, I mean, it's, I think that's where they're starting to get the respect that they're starting to get and why, you know, yeah, there's always going to be discourse about losing earlier games this year, but to see the growth from where this team started to where they're ending now and to see even these micro instances where, you know, to just give analysis because, you know, let's be real, it's two lanes by week. They're going to be preparing for Memphis. This is the Thursday. So it's Saturday in game week. I hate this. Um, I'm going to look at Memphis stuff this weekend and really dive into that kind of stuff. But what I really want to point out about the difference in this bye week from Tulane's last bye week before the Rice game is the energy is there. The intensity is there. It is the same as it was last week. In fact, you know, one of the longer walkthroughs I've experienced, and I would really call it a jog through, there is just pep in these guys' step. But you've also heard a lot of them mention the Rice game, and I quite frankly think like it alarmed them um, how quickly – you can come out, be a little sleep at the wheel and okay, we really got to kick it in gear now. And Memphis, that's just a team that you're not going to be able to do that against. And you look back at, for example, because yes, the title game is locked up. Um, that doesn't mean that these teams don't all have things to play for. We know what Tulane has to play for. If you look back to the two and 10 year, Tulane's second win of the year came in the second to last week of the season. It did not mean anything at that point in time. And they came out and dominated USF. And then they took Memphis down to the wire to what I think was a three-point loss, some career game for Tajay Spears, and that team just refused to quit. And they had nothing to play for at that point. 
And I don't remember what Memphis's deal was, but that just goes to show you, you know, you can't ever count out a conference opponent and you can't count out one that has given you fits and one that I think is the only team they played every year that I've been the sideline reporter. So you look back at that game, you look back at the 22 year, I believe they went something like 28 zero at halftime stadium entirely left. Uh, Jarius Monroe makes the game ending interception in the end zone to win. I think 35 to 28 in his first game action. I was talking with Michael Arata today at practice. It's a game Jaden Kennedy tore his ACL in the middle of, but Memphis came back uh, in that game. And then last year, Friday night lights, that was a grinder. And I think it's one that made Tulane a better team after the fact, just unfortunately, you know, didn't pay off in the end, but you can never discount a veteran quarterback and they have playmakers. So this is a game that it means a lot. There's a lot on the line still here for Tulane. And when you all start clicking like that and you're this close to the end, and I'm not to say that it's not about Memphis, but it's about these guys and it's about what they've set out to do this year and just how locked in they are on that task. Uh, that's really what I've seen more than anything else. And you just see a team that has learned from their mistakes in the middle of a season. You see programs go on for four years making the same mistakes, but everything that we've seen from this team has just been the best case of adaptation that you could ask for. And it's one that I'm really, really excited to be able to continue in this new journey that, you know, I'm going to break that down and what that's all going to entail once I start that endeavor and, and get that all running. But it wouldn't have felt right to me to not have this end show here on, on this space and be able to thank the people that have listened from the beginning, have been the subscribers, been the downloads, been the viewership that uh, allowed me to have this opportunity. And Dave Grubb, you are the one that I have to thank most of all. Corey Glor over at Tulane, Todd, my mentor. I could go on a really rambling list at this point, but really it's the Tulane football program just as much has truly been a pleasure and a joy and one that I can't wait to bring over to this podcast over on Sports Illustrated. <laughs>